yes, we have to start <laughs> because we have a bit of schedule. Uh, okay, so thank you for coming to the session, even a bit late. Um, so the topic is about uh, machine learning models and putting them in production. Uh, especially on Kubernetes. So the target platform is Kubernetes, and the scenario goes like this. You have like Kubernetes cluster, uh, and you want to utilize its power uh, for machine learning uh, workloads uh, as well. So you have your regular applications, you want to enhance them with some intelligence capabilities, and then you need to run also uh, your machine learning models on Kubernetes. Uh, we're going to do this with uh, Kaser. Um, so I'm uh, Stavros Kodopoulos. I work uh, for Red Hat. The past three years I have been working on serverless technologies. Uh, I have a data engineering background and also lately I'm working on the integration of uh, serverless with uh, machine learning. Uh, Red Hat has some uh, open source initiative on, in this area, it's called Open Data Hub. Uh, and also there is uh, collaboration with IBM and other vendors. Um, so, um, this is the high level architecture for most of the uh, solutions you, uh, you have out there for serving models uh, in production. So, uh, this is a high level diagram. So, uh, in your solution, you have one part that does the training, you have uh, another part that does your um, actual inference. Uh, you have some components to store your models, you have uh, probably a feature store, and your applications that can be also in Kubernetes or not on Kubernetes, and you serve the models uh, for your applications. Uh, in this, on this uh, diagram, there are some hidden parts, like for example, training could be online, could be offline, uh, the same for inference, for scoring your models. And uh, this, this two creates uh, different uh, combinations, different interesting combination, combinations that affect your uh, architecture. Here we're going to focus on the small uh, part of model serving uh, on Kubernetes. So the assumption is you have everything else set up, like your CI-CD pipelines, uh, and you want to use that for uh, your machine learning uh, stuff as well. So, um, when people start with uh, deploying models, uh, uh, obviously also in the past, uh, uh, in, uh, in the past, uh, they would start with something simple. So they would start with something like putting everything in a container, like their a model server. It's the implementation you have for the model, and then you deliver it as an image and you <coughs> run it. Um, of course, you can utilize some, uh, some uh, primitives that the environment provides, like deployments, Kubernetes deployments, to improve a bit the capabilities of this uh, kind of uh, uh, delivery. Uh, but the things are not good enough, right? For, for example, even if you use a Kubernetes deployment for managing your replicas for your model server, you will have some uh, limitations, like the rollout strategies will be very specific, limited, like there, there are a couple, but they're not that useful. Uh, so you need something more advanced, because if you add to the picture some kind of, the, the need of monitoring, or the, the need of uh, uh, getting logs out of this, or do or you require to uh, integrate with the rest of, uh, uh, of the applications, or your teams develop different kind of models for different frameworks, then you understand that this is very, very basic and you cannot really uh, just uh, simply go with that. Even, I mean, it's always, of course, depends, uh, de depending on the use case, uh, but in general, as you scale, this is not really uh, enough. So uh, let's see a bit uh, the requirements. This is, these are our requirements for also stuff we're building at Red Hat for what we want to offer to, to users. Uh, you need to have, uh, you, ha you need to set uh, a few requirements before you, uh, you to better understand uh, the, the whole uh, 
the, the needs of this uh, of delivering a machine learning model. So the first thing is to be able to easily package stuff and ship it with your model server to minimize the time um, uh, you, you, you need to offer your model to production. But of course, there are some, uh, uh, some hidden stuff here, like how about dependencies, how I fix them, uh, how I, I, I have uh, alignment with the model server and the actual uh, model. Uh, also, there are some other desires you have, like if I put my model in, in production and I have like uh, requests, that's fine, I can use it. But what about the idle times? Can I scale it to zero? Can I just need it when I actually need it? Uh, so can I use it when I actually need it? So uh, this, this is uh, very, very useful uh, uh, for um, uh, having your models utilized uh, to the extent they are needed to save actual, uh, to, to get gains and save money. So the next thing is to be able to have the, the model and uh, do some pre-processing and post-processing of uh, uh, the request and the, the output you get from the model. Uh, and there are other things like how, how can I utilize GPUs? How can I do, uh, how can I uh, get a prediction from the model using different protocols? For example, uh, gRPC support is pretty critical because it's way faster than HTTP and it's uh, the first, the first uh, uh, option uh, to go with, especially if the requests are small and, and you can uh, uh, utilize this, uh, you have uh, the clients you need for this integration. And the next uh, important thing I would say is uh, uh, having options for rollout deployment. So uh, you, need, you need strategies like canary deployments because you want to uh, change, sweep, uh, change, swap the models in a way that is incremental. So you, you have the traffic rerouted, but not all of it. And also you, there, there, there are scenarios when you decide that you want the new model and you want to swap it uh, uh, completely by changing the traffic. Uh, and so this cannot be done without some help from some framework. Also, you need to be able to do A-B testing. You need to be able to uh, get some traffic, test things, and see how the new model behaves or the, or the new models. Um, so all these are important. Also, you need to have some support of batch inference, for example. There's a, a lot of topics, a lot of requirements. Batch inference means that when I hit my model, I don't want to do it per request. I want to have like, uh, send uh, aggregate the requests and create a vector and hit the model with the and then uh, do the the opposite get the output the results and then send them back to the user per request so it's a multiplex the multiplex thing uh, the other thing which is important is to, is to be able to integrate with certain other components like feature stores and I haven't I haven't listed all the requirements but these are, are really uh, critical ones and so how we can solve this problem in Kubernetes, or at least have op an option for this, is uh, KServe. KServe, uh, a bit of history lesson, KServe was started like in 2019 uh, under the Kubeflow project. Uh, there are a couple of vendors behind it, and they have donated uh, some parts of it, like IBM, Bloomberg, uh, Google, NVIDIA. And also, also, Red Hat is also uh, using uh, part of it in its own uh, products and um, uh, as part of the open source uh, initiative they have for AI. So uh, KServe offers you this idea of uh, a standardized uh, protocol for doing the scoring, having like a contract for the HTTP request, and also gives you a ready to use uh, runtimes for a different popular frameworks uh, that you use to build the uh, models. Uh, the other interesting thing, and uh, this is also very, very important, is uh, how your model maps to actual Kubernetes deployment. So you have a couple of options here, and we're going to focus on the serverless uh, option. Uh, the other options are, are raw Kubernetes deployment, and we saw the limitations. But also you can have like model mesh. Model mesh is, an old, is a quite old technology from IBM that is uh, used really for high density deployed uh, models. And it's an option you want to examine if you want to have a, a really a good utilization. Uh, what we are going to examine on this talk is the, the, the normal usage of delivering something 
uh, containerized on Kubernetes, um, but in a serverless way, in a way that can scale up and down uh, my, my, my model server and also have some other interesting characteristics we're going to examine, like uh, back pressure, for example, or uh, trying to do load balancing of traffic. Um, if you want to check more on the project, you can follow the URL. Um, and so this is a list of the runtimes you get with uh, Kser. Uh, I'm sure if you're in, if you are working in this domain, you are familiar with with uh, I guess all of them or most of them. Um, the protocol for inference that is standardized, it's like a specification like you get with TensorFlow serving, is something that Nvidia offered to the project and it's implemented for, by other uh, popular um, model servers, like uh, the OpenVINO one for deep learning, and it's a, it's a common way to, to be able to get uh, some output from uh, your models. For example, you can ask if my model is ready, uh, and then try to uh, do a query. So, uh, let's focus a bit on the service layer. Uh, so, uh, KServe utilizes Knative Serving. Knative Serving is a, a um, sub-project uh, of the bigger Knative uh, ecosystem. Knative is uh, a framework for, develop for developing cloud-native uh, applications. Um, it, has also, it is also a mature project that has been out there for, for a couple of years. It has been used in production for, again, like three or four years. We, we at Red had also uh, delivering this as a mature productized uh, serverless uh, layer. Uh, and what Kinetic Serving offers is an extension of the concept we described before with Kubernetes deployment. So uh, you can define uh, your, your service, uh, as you see on the upper uh, right corner, simply with uh, a YAML file, and then this is delivered uh, uh, as a deployment with extra uh, capabilities, extensions. So uh, a couple of resources are created uh, which can give you the, the capabilities of routing traffic. So each time uh, I update my, my service, I get a new revision, which is immutable, and I can change the traffic to the revision I want uh, um, each time. This is perfectly uh, matching the requirements I have for the model server. Because I need, for model server, I may have to deploy a new model and then I switch traffic. And at the beginning, I don't want to go uh, directly by switching all the traffic to it. So this, uh, uh, this feature is crit crit critical. The other thing is I can record the history of changes. So there, are, there is a, a mechanism that uh, uh, keeps the history of the changes you do. And each revision matches to, uh, is, is, is uh, created to match these uh, changes. And then the revision is mapped to a, a regular uh, Kubernetes deployment. So um, now the server, serverless layer uh, looks like this in, in practice, also in production uh, setups. You have your request flow, flowing in your cluster, go through Istio. Istio is a service mesh, for, for the people who are not aware of it, uh, service mesh technology, and is actually the glue for all your services. Uh, um, of course, KServe supports other technologies for ingresses, uh, but um, Istio is, uh, is uh, um, the one that's more established and more well uh, integrated. So with Istio, uh, you can divide, define a gateway. Gateway is uh, your, where your traffic uh, gets into your service mesh. And from there, the, the traffic, the request, will hit either your service or it's going to go through a component which is called activator. Activator is the component that is, can be on the path if your uh, service is not scaling out uh, with the rate you need at the moment, but also it can be removed from the path so you can hit directly the services so you, you eliminate this hope when you have enough capacity at the Kinetic uh, service side. Activator is, acts as a component for back pressure. This way, you can have the benefit that if your request uh, hits your service without this being ready, uh, it will be delayed until you have the scale out uh, happening. You have enough replicas to serve the requests. Uh, there is also a component behind the scenes that does this auto scaling thing. 
uh, which scrapes uh, metrics from your Kinect service pods and uh, it makes decisions about doing uh, the actual uh, scaling out. And the autoscaler has its own implementation there, but also it integrates with uh, the Kubernetes one for deployments, so th which is based on utilization of memory and CPU. So uh, inside the Kinect service, the, the, the actual containers that exist there are the Istio sidecar, which is optional, but also the Q proxy that helps with, uh, again, also doing some casting of requests until the, the user container is ready, and the, the user container, which is actually doing the, the stuff that, for the user. The user container is the one we're going to replace with the model server. So we're going to have this architecture uh, along with uh, uh, the specific stuff we need for model serving. So, and if we add KSERP into this picture, from a controller plane point of view, uh, we have KSERP that is manages its own resource, which is called inference service, and then this inference service maps to a Knative service. Uh, so, you, you define as a user something high level with KSERP, and this is under, under the hood is mapped to something that is Knative serving uh, based. Um, and this way, you have a combination that is really uh, very interesting because you get the benefits of two things. Like on one hand, you have the autoscaling thing you need, and the other, you have the abstractions you need from machine learning. Essentially, KServe is an application on top of uh, KNH serving. Um, so, uh, the KServe control plane has uh, some specific job to do, like managing the inference service resources, uh, it allows to support support of different increased technologies. Uh, it also uh, do the reconciliation of all the resources that are related to um, mass, to to the serving staff, but also to the st the staff for serverless. So it, it has a dual uh, uh, work to do. So the other thing is also it's it has some complex has support for complex. Concepts like inference graph, inference graphs, and also it supports another kind of mo mode I talked about earlier. It's called the model mesh thing, which was offered by IBM. And this is something uh, we're not going to talk about in this talk because it's a big topic. Um, but this is something uh, that can be done in parallel. Um, so let's get to the more interesting part of the data plane work. Because we always, with the control plane stuff, we assume things work, so uh, your resources are managed somehow. But for the data plane part, it's interesting to understand how things are um, served. So your user request, the one that is uh, asking for a prediction, goes through different components. You have, on one hand, the transformer that does some data transformation to be, uh, uh, to be aligned with what model expects. And then you have some other components like the explainer. The explainer asks, expl uh, describes why my model uh, gave this prediction. And then you have also the predictor component. From all these components, uh, predictor is the one that is mandatory because you need to do some prediction at the end of the day. The others are optional. So um, when I deploy my predictor service, uh, it, contains a few con it contains a few components containers. As I, as I mentioned earlier, you have the Kube proxy, you have the actual model server that maps your um, framework with which you develop your model, and you have this init container called storage initializer. So the initializer gets somehow your model from some external resource. Uh, and you can scale this service up and down based on uh, Knative serving. So um, there is a reason you can have like transformation outside your model. You got some benefits when you have that, especially if, if you need to uh, be able to do uh, some custom transformations that are not exactly easily implemented in your model, or you want to, to compute your features uh, once and not having them recalculated at the model side. It's time you do a prediction. Also, you can easily uh, uh, separate some concerns like integration with feature stores. Well, let's see an example. This is a... Uh, uh, Inference service, you can, uh, assuming you have installed all the components, you can just deploy on Kubernetes. Uh, 
the inference service here is pretty simple. It defines one service, the predictor. It defines which model you're going to use and from where, it, from where you're going to get the model. So, there, then you can, after, you see, after the model is deployed, you can do some uh, queries. Here is a, a trivial one. Uh, you just uh, do the scoring against the predictor service and we get some uh, results. Uh, so then you can go and check what is happening. So you have, um, here you have the model server deployed and if you check on the right, there are three containers the proxy, the Istio, the Istio sidecar, and the model server. That's why you see three containers up there. And then you have the Kenative service that is responsible for the serverless uh, layer stuff. And then you also have um, the actual inference service we created earlier with the example. About the auto-scaling part, this is configurable. So you can define um, how many replicas you need at minimum. You can also define the maximum, uh, and the auto-scaling layer will make sure that this is respected. Uh, you can define how you're going to scale. You can change, uh, you have some metrics uh, based on uh, request metrics. Actually, it's going to be either concurrency or rate per, per second. Rate per second is the, uh, the request rate uh, that hits your uh, two proxy. And concurrency, how many uh, in-flight requests you have at any given time. These are metrics that are gathered by the autoscaler we mentioned earlier. And this is done all automatically, how you, the, the, auto -scal the scaling and the calculation of uh, uh, traffic and the decision making about the autoscaling. Um, you can specify these options per component, like predictor, transformer, etc., or you can do it at the, at the high level, uh, at, the, at, the, at the high level of the customer resource. resource. Um, and then, after you deploy your model, it's time to get some metrics out of it. So how you do that? KCRF itself offers some standard metrics about all the different type of models. Um, but it's also possible to get the, the, the same uh, metrics from Istio, from your service mesh, because it's, it's, it's a place where you get more reliable uh, uh, data. Uh, because the path, as we see, so is a bit complex, and then things may fail. And at the, at, the, at the point where the traffic enters, at the ingress side, you get more accurate result about the end-to-end -end, uh, uh, request. So is to provide some basic uh, metrics uh, uh, for this. Uh, and also, uh, its, it's runtime, its, case ever, uh, its runtime uh, has its own um, metrics. For example, the Triton model server has its own uh, offered metrics, and, then, and you have to check that as well. Uh, to get uh, more uh, information about your model. Um, here is a sample uh, um, uh, dashboard with Carvana where you get some uh, uh, you get visibility about the uh, requests that were not uh, they were, were uh, they were delayed compared to your threshold you have set. Uh, so I'm checking if my model is is respecting the threshold I have my SLO I have for my um, uh, my request delay. So if, uh, obviously here the, the model is not behaving as expected because it has uh, the delay for its request is more um, than five milliseconds. Um, now I talked about the Istio metrics. You can use them to create uh, proper SLOs with error budget. So you can uh, have uh, you can offer uh, to your team the, the, the model serving in a way that is consistent, consistent with uh, uh, what is expected from your uh, from the business side. So uh, this is um, a Prometheus query that can utilize to create the error budget. Uh, of course, this is more. It is a, it's a bigger topic. It cannot be described here. But if you want to learn more, how can you, you can use these uh, metrics? To create your error budget, you can follow the link. It's a very good blog post on the topic. Uh, and having said that, let's see a bit how Istio can monitor stuff. Istio offers its own observability stack, and with uh, Kiali, uh, the, uh, the the the, observ the the observation of the traffic can be done uh, easily. Um, 
here we see the previous model uh, deployed and the traffic go, going through um, uh, the model server and two other components. The two components you see here with uh, uh, on the upper uh, left corner, they, they are the activator and the autoscaler we mentioned earlier in the diagrams. So auto activator is used for the request, to route the request, and the autoscaler is for scraping from the pods and metrics you need. So you do the scaling stuff. Uh, all these tool, all tools are very useful for um, monitoring your, your models. Uh, and people who actually deploy, deploy Istio, they, they use uh, uh, this stack. So uh, besides monitoring, you also you have logging. Uh, KSERV offers output about what is happening with your model. It emits the logs in the container. If you have uh, an integration with some th third party service, you can scrape the container and get the output from it. Um, also, you can dump the, the logs to some external service uh, where you can get the, uh, the output in a more structured format, which you can use as well uh, to do some more uh, processing of, the, of what is happening of the model. For example, you can fit an explainer, uh, uh, sorry, in a, uh, um, uh, a concept drift detector to detect the uh, if the, the model has changed or the data, data distribution that feeds the model has changed. And th this way you create more complex uh, pipelines. So here's an example of the previous uh, idea where I dump my, my logs to some other service, again, a Knative service. And here we have the data in uh, the log data in a more uh, structured uh, way. So I talked about uh, inference. So far it was a bit of simple inference uh, logic. Uh, KSERV offers a bit more complex uh, uh, capabilities like having graphs, where for example, you can have an ensemble of, uh, uh, of model pre predictions and you can decide which one to choose uh, in parallel. Um, also you can split the traffic or make predictions based on conditions. Here is an example of this. Uh, here we have two predictions happening, two models delivered and having two predictions happening. Uh, the second one happens based on some conditions. So the first service predicts uh, the animal type. Then the request goes through this. If it is a dog, then the output, the request, is going to be f f fed to the next model. And the next model is going to decide about the animal, the dog breed. Uh, so this provides a, a number of uh, different options for building um, graphs, prediction graphs. So uh, that's, we talked at the beginning about deployments and how difficult uh, it is with uh, base primitives uh, you get from Kubernetes. Here is what KSERV offers. Uh, you can define the percentage of traffic you're going to get when you deploy a new model. So initially, if I deploy my, my model with my inference service, I will have uh, my first version of my model, and at some point I can just update the same inference service with this uh, new attribute, the canary traffic uh, percent, so I can make uh, the traffic go 10% to the new model and 90% to my previous model. Uh, this is how things work behind the scenes. You have the same inference service, the same Knative service, but you get two different revisions. So you have one revision that is getting 10% of the traffic and the other 90%. And also you can um, target each revision individually based on some uh, tag capabilities. Here we have a tag, um, it's called previous, and then you have the latest uh, for the newest one. Um, so, uh, KSF doesn't offer A-B testing in itself, I integrated in it, like maybe other uh, frameworks offer, like Seldon or uh, others, but it, you can do that with external tools. Uh, of course, if you go to production, maybe you have to, I mean, depending on what you are doing, you may have your own load testing, if that doesn't work for you, uh, optimized for your special uh, case. Uh, but either it gives you some capabilities there for doing uh, uh, regular uh, uh, testing. Uh, and you, you should be able to uh, do a lot of stuff with this tool anyway, so it's uh, it's useful for the getting started uh, uh, stuff. 
So, um, a lot of stuff covered in a very short time. Uh, but I wanted you to give you an idea of how you can go, uh, go and check yourself this tool. Um, of course, you can cover everything in, in, in so short time. But here are some tips we have for uh, putting stuff in production. Um, you have to make sure that uh, you measure your performance. Uh, you, you do it properly the, the load testing for your, for your model to be able to understand how it behaves. Uh, um, you need to size correctly everything. You need to, to be able to understand, based on your load, uh, what is the proper, uh, what are the pro proper limits uh, uh, and requests for your resource uh, resources for each container. Because um, the defaults are not really that good for all cases, depending also on your type of models. Uh, right now, we're working with. Uh, um, some community user who has been using KServe in production uh, for several years, and we're working with them to add to to Knative serving uh, VPA capabilities. That means uh, vertically uh, integrated with uh, what Kubernetes offers for vertically scaling uh, the containers. This is important because in any scenario, the first step you want to do. And this means and this. This is the same story for every uh, application. You have to size it correctly. Uh, uh, you have to size correctly each individual container and then scale out. Um, and we are working with uh, this user uh, to improve uh, uh, how you uh, size uh, automatically on Kubernetes the the containers, the model servers, and the other containers used for from. Uh, uh, K-native uh, serving. Uh, this is pretty critical, um, and we are also looking at how we can optimize the whole uh, thing, uh, K-serve side and uh, all the components. Because uh, ideally, there are other interesting use cases you, you want to deal with it, with uh, this. For example, if I have a machine learning model uh, that is small and is offered at the edge, uh, you want to also be able to deliver something like that and uh, uh, at the edge as well. Uh, we have some initiatives there. Uh, at Red Hat and other vendors are doing the same. So uh, we want to cover other patterns, like for example, have a big model on the cloud and a small one at the edge, you want to deliver with one tool. So uh, Knative serving, for example, doesn't work on the edge right moment, at the moment, but we're also working on the same story uh, uh, at the edge. And, there are other things you have to consider, like uh, authorization, how you make sure that who deploys the model is actually the one uh, you want to deploy your model, who touches your model, who sees your, the, uh, your data, the traffic there. You, you basically need the crimson for everything. Um, what your cluster offers in terms of GPU sharing, and of course, your observability stack. Um, you need to have a proper monitoring. Without it, you can, don't have visibility on uh, on the stuff you're doing, and imagine this happens at scale because you may there are there are, there are people out there who want to offer this as a service within their own company, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of stuff you need to deal with it, uh, but also of course it depends on your, your use case. Uh, but we have seen users, for example, they ask for multi-tenancy on this, how they separate uh, the whole thing with for its different team. Um, so. Uh, if you want to try all that I talked about, I have a, a repo ready for this, a guide for this. You can play, this is all, uh, the examples are all on Minikube. I do want to use something you can't try uh, locally. So uh, please try it. If you want to test or add something, more examples on it, uh, feel free to create a pull request or anything. But also, uh, more, more, more importantly, if you want to uh, help with these technologies, Please reach us out at the uh, project uh, channels. For example, there is a channel for Knative project, and also for there is for KServe. The, the, the community there is very welcoming. Uh, um, we have uh, new. We are helping contributors there. Uh, um, I'm I can, I'm helping with the serving side of the Knative project. Also, we, the KServe community is very welcoming. Uh, uh, reaches out so we can help if you want to contribute. 
and if you are interested in these technologies. So that's it. I hope I was fast enough because it's a bit late <laughs> for all of you. Thanks. Thank you. So if you have any questions or yes. When, when you say you scale down to zero in uh, this setup, do you also scale down your uh, Kubernetes nodes, like the workers there, to zero? It and if yes, does mm -hmm. this mean that you have a kind of cold start waiting time for the requests to, is, this, is it something that you use based on the client? Yeah, this, these are two different things. The, the autoscaler uh, described here is not the cluster autoscaler, but it can be combined. Yes, but yeah. I mean, in terms of pricing, if you don't scale your node pools as well to zero, then you pay for them. So this is the, the idea of the serverless. This is why I'm asking. Yeah, you need to be able to maybe predict your, uh, your, traffic, uh, um, your, your traffic workload and decide maybe up front to have like a corn pool or something. Yes. So you have, of course, you have cold start at different phases. Uh, if your lo model is very big, also you're getting a lot of uh, uh, delays. Uh, there are some solutions there. Of course, there's no perfect solution for this, uh, but there, there are some options. Uh, also, there is a project from, uh, uh, I think it's Red Hat, but also I think it's other vendors. It's called Cruise. Cruise does, uh, Basin optimization and your configuration options. Uh, and on the roadmap, there is this approach of predictive uh, configuration, uh, of predicting the configuration of your services. So you can optimize the, uh, what you need upfront. So if I need to have, like, let's say, in five minutes from now, I need five pods, I can have you know, the prediction done for, the, for this and be, have the pods ready before they actually need it. So there are some things, uh, yeah, on the, the roadmap. What's Cruise, cruise, yeah. So it's open source. Uh, of course, there is a product as well. Uh, but yeah, this is a generic problem for everything, right? It's not just model serving. Yeah. Okay. See. Thank you.